So first of all, we'd just like to thank everybody for coming to uh, the event today. We appreciate everybody taking time out of their busy schedules to come here. And uh, obviously, we just hope that uh, everybody's going to be able to take away at least one positive thing from, from today's events and all the speakers that you're going to be able to hear today. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping items uh, through this hallway right here. We have the washrooms for anybody that needs to use the washrooms throughout the course of the day. Uh, we're currently... Uh, currently, right now, we're still trying to find uh, the location for a quiet room for anybody. If anybody needs to get up and leave and uh, just go find some quiet time to themselves. Uh, myself, my name is Sean Taylor. Uh, this is Joe Foster. We are um, the two that started the I've Got Your Back 911 campaign. And uh, we're happy to be here talking in front of you guys today. And uh, I'll pass it over to Gary. Thank you. My name is Gary Ruby. I'm with uh, Badge Life Canada. And I want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, we've just um, we've just found out that just outside the doors here, there's like a little couch area. We're going to have that uh, particular area be a, uh, a designated quiet room, quiet area. So if somebody feels uh, distressed, or if you're feeling that you need to speak with somebody, please seek somebody out. Seek one of us. A lot of help in this room. A lot of great people in this room. And don't go out there by yourself if you're feeling stressed if you're triggered you know just let somebody know that you're leaving the room so uh, again thank you for coming um, we uh, yeah, we were excited to do this again you know we've been doing this now since uh, last year uh, 2015 and uh, and we've put together a, a few conferences and we're really pleased to be able to uh, to do this with uh, with um, I've got your back 911 with with uh, Jill and Sean they've been huge uh, supporters of us and, and vice versa. Um, so we want to open up the day with, uh, with a welcome from um, Senator Ralph Wolf Thistle. He's a Mady's Nation, uh, from Mady's Nation of Ontario. Ralph would come up please. <coughs> Greetings from the Métis Nation of Ontario. I uh, first want to recognize the territory which we stand on. How do we pronounce it? Oneida. And uh, so we recognize as the Métis that we stand on the unsurrendered territory of the United Nation. With that also, I'd like to open with a prayer. I am, uh, I'll introduce myself as Rolf Wolf Thistle. I'm senator with the Great Lakes Métis. And through my spiritual journey, I've come here to be with you today. So I say, God, creator of the universe, God of Abraham, the great spirit, we are your children, first responders, the Métis, veterans, family of friends. We come together in council to support our loved ones and the people that care for us. We are part of the universe. We are part of the world of the winged ones, the four-legged, the swimmers, the crawlers, the seen and unseen. When we are in harmony and peace and gather in council like today, wonderful things could happen for our brothers and sisters, for our fellow. So I say to you from the Métis Nation of Ontario, which Chai which Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Um, Badger Life Canada, who are we? You know, Badger Life Canada started um, in 2010 by a gentleman um, in Ottawa. His name is, uh, is uh, Peter Platt. And uh, Peter, unfortunately, uh, lost his battle to... Uh, Cancer, and at the time when Peter put together a, uh, um, to him, what was a uh, an anonymous website where men and women that were feeling um, distressed and, and were in in uh, professions that we all chose to be in and first responders, um, it gave them a place to go anonymously. It gave them a place to seek out other men and women that were suffering and struggling the same 
sort of pain that they were going through without fear of retribution and, and, uh, and being punished and being ridiculed and shamed like a lot of us were in the past uh, for coming forward with uh, mental health and, and, uh, and other types of uh, emotional distress and injuries and depression and anxiety. So um, as we move forward, uh, uh, Bill and Lynn Rusk, uh, Bill's at the table here, he's our executive director and Lynn Rusk over here is our director and myself um, uh, took this uh, this little website and turned it into something a little bit bigger and and now it's it's kind of evolved and uh, we've become a national organization we're a non-for-profit we're self-funded so uh, if anybody feels that they have a, a tiny generous bone in their body and an extra shackle in their back pocket donated to badge of life we'd be extremely uh, honored and humbled by uh, any kind of a donation um, we're in the process of, of um, having an application reviewed by the Canada Revenue Agency to receive our full charitable status. So that's in the works right now. And, uh, we're hopeful to receive that in the next few months. Um, we, we plan on, on hosting more conferences moving forward and uh, um, we're all lived experience. Everybody in this room has, has uh, you know, earned a seat in the chair. And that's all we need to say is when you're feeling like shit and you're feeling like crap and you're feeling like this is garbage and my life sucks, I just look at one person and say, me too. That's all you need to hear from me, me too. Because I've been there, I sat in that seat. Everybody here are in the seat. So, um, you know, the, the theme for today is, is uh, it's a little bit different than what we've done in the past. We're gonna be talking, uh, uh, we're gonna have some, some specific speakers uh, and, and we're gonna have a couple of panels in the afternoon with, with the room broken up in half and, uh, um, and, and you'll have chances to, to and opportunities to interact with, uh, with some of the people presenting as well. So you'll be able to ask questions and and we'll be able to uh, to give feedback and and um, it'll be an exciting day. So we're looking forward to it. Um, we have we have exhibitors right across the room. I'm not going to introduce everybody, but just please make make time during breaks. Um, you know, between networking and and uh, and, um, and getting coffee, please introduce yourself to the great men and women that are here, and and um, and have a look at what they've what they've got. You know, there's there's a lot of really great information here. Uh, there's there's things available for sale. There's raffles. There's some artwork back there that's been donated, and uh, I think they're charging um, five dollars for three tickets, and, and you can walk away with a nice print. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for housekeeping for now. Um, again, thank you for being here. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Jill to introduce uh, our first speaker. So, our first speaker this morning will be speaking on uh, what composes an operational stress injury diagnosis. There we go, there I am. Thank you very much. This is a, uh, it's a big topic, um, and it's a boring topic <laughs> in some ways uh, for me, uh, maybe not necessarily for you guys, but uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time going over symptom by symptom, everything that can possibly go on. Um, but uh, I do want to uh, uh, introduce you to you know, some of the, uh, the injuries that can arise as a result of the work uh, that you uh, are called upon to do. The term operational stress injury, actually we can be very proud of its Canadian origins from the Canadian military, and it's a fairly new term, going back to 2001. Uh, it's a non-clinical term. There, there's nothing official uh, from, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, um, you know, diagnosis. Operational stress injury does not exist as a diagnostic term. It's not a diagnosis. It is a group of disorders that are commonly associated with, uh, with the military and first responders. Here's a, in a nutshell, here are a bunch of them, okay? Uh, Non-exhaustive non list. Post-traumatic stress disorder is the granddaddy of them all, but it's definitely not the only one. Um, we've got other stress-related disorders, such as adjustment disorders. Um, you can think of an adjustment disorder as uh, difficulty adjusting to an event which may not meet the criteria for being a trauma, okay? So, you know, getting fired from a job. Right? That's not going to count as a trauma, but it can be a very difficult thing to adjust to. Anxiety disorder, such so as panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, which is essentially excessive worrying, things like this, other forms of anxiety that can arise. The mood disorders, 
uh, the classic one, depression, also bipolar disorder. Uh, sometimes these things can be um, provoked by trauma as well. Um, and sometimes they can be provoked by uh, the side effects of the treatment for trauma. And so the medications can sometimes, uh, in certain cases, uh, provoke a, a hypomanic, uh, you know, the excessively um, uh, energetic response uh, that some people will get uh, to the, uh, the, the medications at times. Substance use disorders, of course. Uh, the, the attempt to numb out the pain will often lead to excessive drinking, excessive drug use, and this will lead to substance use disorders. Dissociative, dis dissociative disorders. Dissociation is a very normal uh, kind of a process. Uh, it, everyone does it. Some of you may be doing it right now, okay? In terms of daydreaming, okay? Uh, you're sitting in a class, it's boring, blah, 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 wah, wah, wah. You know, the teacher starts to sound like the trumpet from, uh, from uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas. And, uh, you know, you, boom, you're off in a different place. That's essentially dissociation. Um, so it's a normal psychological process, uh, which can be used excessively uh, to begin to numb out uh, a, a pain. It can go from daydreaming at the one extreme to full-blown dissociative identity disorder at the far extreme where literally the personality becomes fragmented and different pieces of identity actually hold different pieces of trauma. Usually that would arise uh, in early childhood, from early childhood trauma. But I have seen it in first responders. Somatic symptom and related disorders. Uh, probably the classic one here would be a, a, a conversion disorder. If you have a capacity for dissociation, you can think of uh, dissociation, hypnosis is a form of dissociation. And you can be hypnotized into experiencing your body in very, very different ways. Uh, so you can be hypnotized so that you know, your arm feels totally numb, as an example. Okay? Now, if you have dissociation as a, uh, as a, a capacity, um, it, and it, you know, it can be spontaneously developed into sort of a self-hypnosis, and you can end up with physical symptoms that do not have an organic foundation. We call this a, a, a conversion disorder. So the history of PTSD, it's often said that PTSD is a new diagnosis, that it was completely unrecognized before the Vietnam War. Uh, this is actually not true at all. Um, in fact, uh, soldiers have been identifying emotional changes since ancient times. Uh, it's you know, written in Greek about uh, you know, the experience of uh, you know, being psychologically damaged following battles. Shell shock in World War I was similar to PTSD. We often, you know, you hear people referencing shell shock as if that's just simply what they mean. Let's play that video. So this is a little video of a, uh, a man suffering from shell shock, World War I, it's very short. I think you can safely say that this is not the way that PTSD presents today. What you're seeing here is literally, um, it's probably a conversion disorder, I would hazard a guess. What they thought they were dealing with is perhaps the, uh, the actual physical damage to the nervous system caused by shock waves. That's not very realistic. Um, what happens essentially, you know, and you know, the, the amount of stress that the, uh, the, the soldiers in, uh, in the trenches were undergoing is just unbelievable. This is the same man uh, following uh, successful treatment you can see that he's now much better able to walk. But you'll also see in a moment here, he's not entirely symptom free. Wash his hands. This certainly looks more like, you know, what we would consider post-traumatic stress disorder to look like today. This is, you know, just the incredible tension. What happens essentially in, in, in psychiatry, psychology, these things are very, very closely tied to culture and expectations of how a disease manifests feeds into the presentation of that disease, identifying that disease and describing it as this is the way that disease manifests feeds back into the culture. So if, you, if the disease is supposed to manifest as an inability to walk smoothly, then that is in fact what will end up presenting. 
Whoops. Ah, I've totally turned it off. What did I do there? Uh-oh. Do you have any idea what I just did? <laughs> I hit the bottom button here. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Excellent. All right. 10 this is a kind of a, a, a surprising finding I found. 10% of, of soldiers during World War II were hospitalized during the war for psychiatric reasons. So it's not that this thing wasn't presenting, it's not that this thing wasn't there, and it's not that it was not being recognized, in fact, that it was. 1953, our diagnostic uh, Bible, the DSM, uh, the first version of the DSM did have a version of PTSD called gross stress reaction, which was describing you know, the, the, the reaction to overwhelming fear as a response to conditions of great stress, including combat and, and other catastrophes. So again, this thing has been around for a long time. It's not so very new. It's changed a little bit. So uh, DSM-4, um, the criteria were this. So the person has to have experienced a traumatic event in which both of the following are present, witnessing, uh, experiencing, or being confronted with an event or series of events that involve actual or threatened death or serious injury, or a threat to the physical integrity of self or others, and the person's response involves intense fear, helplessness, or horror. The main groups, uh, uh, symptom groups here, uh, the, the traumatic event is persistently re-experienced through intrusive thoughts and images, dreams, flashbacks, things of this nature. <coughs> Avoidance and numbing the, uh, uh, the experience with, uh, by avoiding reminders, withdrawing from interaction and, and pleasurable activities, feeling detached from others. Persistent uh, symptoms of increased arousal, uh, that were not present before the trauma, of course, uh, with uh, difficulty falling asleep, irritability, outbursts of anger, difficulty concentrating or hypervigilance, and exaggerated startle response. Now, we start to bring in some changes to, uh, to PTSD in DSM-5, this comes out in 2013. It's a very, it's a reasonable question why these changes were brought about. Some of them make it easier to diagnose, others make it more difficult, it's no longer grouped with the anxiety disorders. It's now under trauma and stress-related disorders, so it's now a group of disorders on its own. There's a clearer definition of the traumatic event. And we have to, this is one of the bizarre things, by the way, about diagnosing PTSD. There are not, there's nothing else in DSM where my job as someone who's diagnosing is never mind the person, what was the event? I'm no longer diagnosing the human being in front of me. I'm looking at the story and trying to understand what the story was, and it's got nothing to do with the person, right? So was there death, you know, what, what happened becomes an important part of the diagnosis, which is bizarre when you think about it, okay? That's bizarre. Why am I, why am I not paying attention to the symptoms of the person in front of me? Why is the event even relevant? There are people who present with symptoms of PTSD full-blown. The criteria doesn't meet it. Right? Criterion A doesn't meet it, so they don't get the diagnosis. And that, you know, it's kind of a, it does definitely happen. Workplace bullying and harassment would be a very classic example of that, where you can see someone who's like completely falling apart with, with post-traumatic stress, but Criterion A is never met. So they, so they play with some of the symptom clusters. We'll take a look at these. Under the WSIB, with the new changes, only PTSD, is diagnosed, um, uh, you know, is, is going to meet the criteria for the presumption, uh, and it's only under DSM-5, and it has to come from a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Other, all those other diagnoses, they can all be OSIs, okay? Um, but only PTSD is going to get the special treatment from WSIB, which means there's no need to point to a specific traumatic event, and there's less concern for whether or not it may have been pre-existing. So you get the, the assumption that if you're presenting with PTSD, you're a first responder. Work has something to do with what is going on here, regardless of what else is going on in your life. Okay? All the, you know, before that, it was always, well, was it pre-existing? And if it was pre-existing, then we don't blame the work. Right? But we try to avoid it anyhow. So it leads to faster approval of the WSIB claims, and it's making a huge difference. But only if you meet the criteria for PTSD under DSM-5. So let's take a careful look at those, uh, those criteria. So it's exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence in one or more of the following ways. Directly experiencing the traumatic events, 
witnessing in person the event as it occurs to others, learning that the traumatic event occurred to a close family member or a close friend, but in cases of actual or threatened death, the event must have been violent or accidental. See, they start to get into these weird little gray areas, right? Oh, this one's going to count, that one's not. Okay, that's not clinical. That's legal. Okay, think of the money. That, this is the thing about the DSM. It's a money-driven enterprise coming up with these diagnostic things. So they're trying to clamp down on the diagnosis in some ways because they thought it was being overdiagnosed. How you define overdiagnosed? It's costing somebody too much money. Ex and experiencing repeated or extreme exposure to the details of traumatic events. This does not apply to exposure through electronic media, television, movies, or pictures unless the exposure is work-related, okay? So you get to these weird little gray areas, okay? Can you get PTSD from watching the Twin Towers fall on 9-11? No, unless you had a family member who worked there, then yes. Or if it was your job to watch the security cameras, then yes. You get into these strange little gray areas where this is not clinical, this becomes you know, it's got nothing to do with how the person is presenting and only to do with the plot. So the presence of one or more of the following intrusion symptoms, recurrent, involuntary, and intrusive distressing memories of the traumatic event, distressing dreams with the content being related to the event, dissociative reactions such as flashbacks in which the individual feels or acts as if the traumatic event were recurring. I just want to pause for a second. One, one of my pet peeves, right, is a lot very often here, people uh, talking about flashbacks. It's actually very rare uh, to, to actually have a true flashback. Uh, it has to be dissociative. You have to feel as if it is happening again, okay? And what most people describe as a flashback is actually an intrusive thought or memory, okay? Which is far more common. Dissociation, you know, at that level of dissociation. I'll give you an example of a real flashback. Um, Soldier I worked with, his wife wakes up during the night, he's not in the bed beside her, she goes looking for him, finds him in the basement, surrounded by a collection of machetes and bayonets. He looks at her, he, she knows that he does not recognize her. That's a flashback. That's a full-blown, full-blown flashback. Intense or prolonged distress, the exposure to reminders of the traumatic events, and physiological reactions. The, you know, the, the panic and that kind of a thing can go along with that. Persistent avoidance, trying to not, okay, uh, avoiding the, uh, the internal and external reminders. Negative alterations in beliefs, attitude, and mood. This is a new one, okay, where we want to see something going on inside the person is quite different. Inability to remember an important aspect of the traumatic events. Uh, that could be, of course, dissociation. Persistent and exaggerated negative beliefs or expectations about oneself, others, in the world. This is the most common one I hear from police officers. I'm a broken toy, okay? By which they usually mean, I've been tossed aside by the service. No one can be trusted. Racism, racism. I hear a lot of racism in my office, okay? It's actually uh, a result of trauma, okay? You can overgeneralize from traumatic events, okay? And bear this in mind if you're a police officer, so can the people you're dealing with on the street, right? So you show up in that uniform, your uniform is triggering that person, right? So it goes both ways, it goes both ways. Altered cognitions and mood, um, persistent disordered beliefs about the causes and consequences of the trauma, blaming yourself, blaming others. Persistent negative emotional state, fear, horror, anger, guilt, shame. Reducing your interest in activities, feelings of detachment or estrangement from others. Persistent inability to experience positive emotions, happiness, satisfaction, loving feelings. Now, not all of these are necessary, right? The way we, we operate, we have a checklist. How many of these symptoms do you meet? You don't have to have all of them to meet the diagnosis. And then we have the hyperarousal. Irritability, <laughs> anger, aggression, reckless or self-destructive behavior, hypervigilance, Pause for a second on hypervigilance. The hypervigilance is an interesting one because we have to ask what exactly is hyper, okay? 
at what point is it vigilant and at what point is it hyper vigilant? Okay, I spent uh, one summer uh, reading hydrometers. I spent three years spotting every single hydrometer I walked past. Okay, could not. Did you know that there are, are hydrometers on billboards? I do. <laughs> Can't walk past the hydrometer for three years. I couldn't walk past one without no. Went to New Orleans. Oh, it's a water meter pit in the ground. Right. My brain got well trained to do a certain thing. Your brains are well trained to do certain things, which can include looking for security risks. You're walking through the mall, right? You're going, there's an escape route, there's an escape route, there's a bad guy, there's an escape route. You know. To what degree is that hypervigilant? To what degree is it simply good training? Right? It's a good question to ask. You know, this is, it's quite a normal thing. It's really about how much does it bother you? I've actually trained people, I've said, Go to the mall, keep doing it, use your training, and have fun, okay? Play the spy game. Who's the bad guy in the room? What are you going to do when, 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 when you know, the stuff goes down, right? That's actually a, you know, it's a way of sort of owning it, <clears throat> reducing the distress that comes with it. The exaggerated startle responses. I've seen people, I, I go into the waiting room and say, hi, boom, jumping out of their skin, right? All the time. Problems with concentration, sleep disturbance. And some of the other things, we, had, we need a duration of one or more, you know, one month or longer, otherwise it's acute stress disorder, which does, of course, predict the development of PTSD. Um, this is the most important thing, okay? It has to have clinically significant distress or impairment for any psychiatric diagnosis that's essentially true. Significant distress or impairment, usually both, can be one or the other, okay? You can have a lot of these symptoms if they don't bother you. If they're not getting in the way, you're not going to meet their diagnosis, okay? Onset is delayed if it's six months or more following the events, and it's not due to medication, substance abuse, or any other condition. Some of the differences, uh, the removal of the requirement, you remember I, you know, the, the dsm 4 had this requirement they had to uh, have distress at the time. Thank goodness that's been removed. A lot of first responders do not experience distress at the time of the event. They don't break down at the side of the road with a motor vehicle accident in front of them. They've got a job to do. They're going to, you know, go do it and they get through it, right? And then they go back to the, uh, you know, back to the station or whatever, and they suck it up because that's what they're expected to do, right? So they don't necessarily fall apart at the time of the event, and that was one of the reasons for not diagnosing it frequently. Now we remove that because that is such a common thing. We split avoidance and numbing into two different symptom clusters, which has the effect of changing an or into an and, okay? So it used to be this, the avoidance and, and numbing symptoms, here's your checklist. If you get X number, you meet it. What if you had nothing but avoidance and no numbing? Okay, no big deal under DSM-4, right? You still meet the criteria. Under DSM-5, you have to have both, right? The addition of alterations in cognition and mood, which can be a little bit difficult to you know, to be able to find out in an, you know, a, a very quick assessment. You really got to know somebody to get to know what's going on inside their heads. Assessing OSIs. Quick joke for you. How do you know a family physician is smarter than a psychologist? Because it takes a psychologist six hours to diagnose ADHD, but the physician can do it in 15 minutes. <laughs> Psychological assessment is a long, drawn-out process that you're going to hate if you haven't gone through it yet. Okay, um, it's it's a very careful process. It's exhausting and irritating. Uh, I, I, you know, people they look fine to me when they leave my office. They come back and say, "I slept for three days." You know, it's it's really tough to go through. Begins with a comprehensive history, reviewing any documentation if it's available, administering the psychological tests, observing behavior may include consultation with family and other professionals, preparing a report, and providing feedback and recommendations for treatment. So, we use questionnaires. These can vary from brief symptom checklists, which enable a review of each relevant symptom, right, but they're usually very easily distorted. If you want, you know, your doctor says, here, complete this, you know, 20-item questionnaire on depression. If you want to look like you're depressed, and you see an item that says, you know, I feel guilty all the time. Well, you know what to say in order to look depressed. So it's very face valid. You can distort them if you want. Or if you don't want to look depressed, you know how to fake it. 
right? You know, I'm going to lose my job if I say yes on this questionnaire, right? So these are often part of a psychological assessment as well as a psychiatric evaluations, uh, but a, the better, more in-depth one will use the standardized psychological tests, which are typically much longer, right? You know, hundreds of items instead of, a, you know, a, a couple of dozen. This allows comparison to a normative database. So how different is this person from the average person in the community or the average person in the, in the field? This, we allow the uh, understanding of how does the person approach the test. If you say absolutely everything is wrong with me, it's not valid. If you say absolutely nothing is wrong with me, it's not valid. If you answer randomly, it's not valid. And most importantly, you know, for you know, a lot of these, these um, uh, situations, we can find out is it, if there's exaggeration, was it inadvertent? Okay, so is this distress? And so yeah, the, the scores are going to be elevated because when you're depressed, everything looks bad and you see every single item you know, as, as referring to you and how bad you are doing, right? So that can be a cry for help, it can be distress. There is, of course, also conscious exaggeration, right? And psychology is really actually pretty good at spotting this, okay? But we've got tests, I would not want to try to fake on these tests, right? Because I would probably be caught by them. I don't know which items really refer to the malingering. Usually more than one test gets used. They do tend to be exhausting. They're harder to fake, though. And it gives us nice, hard evidence. So when we're dealing with WSIB, this kind of a thing, we can say, here's the evidence, right? It was a valid administration of this test, and this is what this test showed, OK? So we're, it allows us to back things up. We're not just listening to what the story is and going with it. Check the time here. OK. Now I want to pause for a second on this concept of the disorder versus the injury. And it's, I'm, you know, Scott and I actually had this, this talk recently, and it's, I'm not picking on it. <laughs> because it's, it's one that comes up all the time. Is it a disorder or is it an injury? There's tremendous hostility in some quarters to the use of the word disorder. This bothers me. You'll hear people saying, I don't have a disorder, I have an injury. I'm not really mentally disordered. Right? They get insulted with that kind of a phrase. And there's a preference for using terms like PTSI or PTS in the place of PTSD. Why does this bother me? Because not all disorders are injuries, but all injuries are disorders. Okay? You cannot have an injury that is not a disorder, where a disorder is, de is de uh, defined as a disruption in the usual or expected function of an organ or system and in psychology with resulting impairment or distress, okay? The event happened, okay? It changes how you deal with things. It changes your internal and external experience, okay? That's an injury, absolutely. It is also a disorder, okay? By this definition, that's a disorder. The injury, an injury is a disorder which is caused by an external force or in psychology an event. So assessment leads to diagnosis. Diagnosis specifies what disorder is present and if that disorder is an injury, okay? Now, post-traumatic stress disorder is not the only OSI. You've got all these other OSIs, and each one of them is a disorder, right? We don't speak of major depressive injury. It's major depressive disorder. We don't speak of generalized anxiety injury. It's generalized anxiety disorder, okay? They are all disorders, so we're pretty much stuck with the word disorder because without proving a negative change in function, no one's going to get compensation, no one's going to get, you know, the, um, uh, the sick leave, right? There has to be a disorder present in order for compensation to be offered. Now, doesn't using the word injury reduce the stigma? Yes, so long as you've got PTSI. No, if you happen to be experiencing any of the others, right? because they all have disorder embedded right in them. Just as PTSD does as well, okay? So why are people so against it? I think it's because of the us versus them mentality. I don't want to be like them. They're not like me. And I don't want to use a word that makes me like them. So who is this them? Well, it's the disordered. It's the mentally disordered. If the word disorder is causing stigma, it's because of ignorance. So we have inaccurate assumptions about what disorder means. 
the idea that it implies a genetic or a biological origin. Here's a question for you. I've never, I've never, you know, is it worse to have a damaged brain or to be chemically imbalanced than it is to have a psychological disorder? For one thing, it's actually a nonsensical question because you can't have one without the other. This conversation is changing your brain right now, right? I can change your brain by having a conversation with you, right? That's a psychological change, but there are no psychological changes that are not founded in your biology. There are no biological changes that will not impact your psychology. These words are separate only in that sentence. They are not separate in you, right? We are one, right? We are one. So we, we have this idea that somehow being chemically imbalanced takes away stigma, you know? It's a real disorder because it's a chemical imbalance. I look at that, I don't, I'm not sure that I'd actually prefer to be chemically imbalanced than to have a psychological disorder. I don't know. I think it, you know, it's, it's just whatever it is. They think that the word disorder implies psychosis. That's, of course, not true. They think that disorder means crazy or irrational. This is not true. None of these assumptions are true. So where does this, this stigma come from? In the first responders, those assumptions are based on the experience of those dealing with people who obviously have mental disorders. They're suicidal, they're violent, they're irrational, they're out of control. Experience can be wildly inaccurate when experience is based on a pre-selected sample. Okay? Almost all the first responders I know have an operational stress injury. Does that mean that all first responders have operational stress injuries? No. Many are doing just fine, but they don't show up in my office. I don't get a chance to know them. So the experience of the first responders of the mentally disordered is similarly skewed, right? 911 only gets called when that person is in crisis, right? Most people with mental disorders will never have contact with emergency services. So if you're, if you're experienced with the mentally disordered, are those crazy people you're dealing with on the street? And someone's saying, well, by the way, you have a mental disorder. That stigma, that assumption is inside of you. It's not about the disorder. It's about your experience with that word. So I'm happy to use the word injury to describe disorders, but I think the desire to eliminate the word disorder from PTSD is based on internalized <coughs> stigma and ignorance, and I don't like that. Having a disorder is actually a very powerful source of improved empathy and understanding when you're dealing with emotionally disturbed people, right? The power that you people speak of, right? to say, hey, me too. Imagine the power of wearing a uniform and dealing with the emotionally distressed person and being able to say, hey, me too. That'd be incredible, right? If, imagine if you go to a doctor and the doctor says, hey, me too. How would you feel? Deeply and profoundly understood, right? You go, oh, this guy gets it, right? So imagine being able to do that on the street. It'd be incredible, incredible. You have to grow into that, <laughs> right? You have to be able to do that within yourself to overcome your own stigma about your own condition in order to be able to be that open and be that real as some of you have achieved, right? Being able to reach out to others and say, hey, me too, is a very vulnerable thing to do and incredibly powerful. It breaks down the barrier between us and them. Now, second time. Oh, I'm going not too bad. Who gets an OSI? These are some factors that are statistically related to developing PTSD, PTSD being the granddaddy of them all. I'm going to assume it applies to them all. Temperamental changes, okay? Childhood emotional problems, prior history of mental disorders, okay? Those are statistically related. Biological issues, any family psychiatric history. PTSD is more common among women Okay? But, bear this in mind, this is not about weakness. Women have a higher rate of exposure to trauma. Okay? Women's trauma also tends to involve severe violation in the form of sexual assault. So the fact that PTSD may be more common among women says nothing about the strength of women. All we have to do for that is think about childbirth. Trust us, if men had to go through it, you know, it would be a, we'd be looking at that very differently, right? <coughs> Matter of fact, look at childbirth as a trauma, and no wonder more women are experiencing PTSD. Because a lot of childbirth is in fact traumatic, right? 
I mean, I get, I get traumatized just thinking about it. <laughs> In first responders, okay, gender differences are much smaller or statistically non-significant. So, environmental factors, lower socioeconomic status, lower education or lower intelligence, exposure to prior trauma, especially childhood trauma, childhood adversity, whether it's economic deprivation, family dysfunction, parental separation, or death. Oh, by the way, a lot of, you know, when I look at my caseload, right, a lot of the people that I've been seeing for many, many years are the ones who, on top of the adult trauma, also have the very messed up childhood. It really interferes with the ability to recover from the later trauma. When I look at, um, as I sometimes do, uh, I, I do um, employment screening for the RCMP. And one of the things I'm certainly looking for is what was the childhood like, right? If this person has a really disturbed childhood, that certainly is going to increase the likelihood of a, of a difficult response to the, uh, to the job. Cultural characteristics, the suck it up attitude, right? The suck it up attitude, which is present in so many or has been historically and is beginning to change, we sincerely hope, actually encourages negative coping strategies, such as avoidance and numbing, blaming yourself, right? And as Gary was saying, you know, all, all first responders ever hear is you screwed up, you messed up, right? They don't get a lot of support from their, uh, from their, their bosses, their peers. Substance abuse, right? Yeah, that was a tough call. Here. Minority, racial, or ethnic status. I would also add, uh, you know, undoubtedly uh, gender. Um, uh, sexual orientation uh, issues would certainly be uh, busy. Anything stressful is what it boils down to. If you've got other stressors, chronic stressors going on in your life, right, that's going to make it more likely. It's going to, you know, eventually the next drop rock get, gets dropped into the bucket is going to make it overflow. On the other hand, social support is a protective factor. So the more people around you, right, that are caring for you, are there for you, are listening for you, watching out for you, the more people you have around you, the better off you're going to be. The nature of the trauma, of course. The more severe the trauma, the greater likelihood of a traumatic reaction. That's a bit of a no-brainer. Perceived threat to life, personal injury, interpersonal violence, especially if it includes betrayal, right? Moral injuries, the issue of being a perpetrator. If you're the one, as a police officer, you're in that situation of having to take a life, right? If you are a, um, a soldier, right, uh, you're going to have to do that. This becomes very problematic for you. Witnessing atrocities, this is so common among peacekeepers, they're called upon to be a witness and do nothing, which is extremely difficult when your training says, do something. Dissociation during the trauma, especially if it's persistent following it. Development of acute stress disorder. Now, when a man loves a woman very, very much, he lies down with her and... <laughs> I love that this, but the reason I'm using this is, um, this kind of represents to me what it's like to be a first responder. And all those sperm cells are traumas. Okay? Only one gets through. Okay, so what's the one that's going to get through? Most traumas are going to bounce off. You're going to be able to deal with most, okay? But some are going to break through. The ones that tend to break through, okay, may be the ones that violate our sense of a just and predictable world. The death of a child, the violent death of an elderly person. These are the ones that break the rules of how the world is supposed to operate. Those that resonate with us personally, are more likely to cut through the barrier. People who remind us of a family member, right? Or if we've experienced a similar trauma ourselves. Take a look at this chimpanzee. This chimpanzee has just come across the dead body of a troop member. Okay? You can see written on this chimpanzee's face exactly what it's feeling, because it shares 98% of its DNA with us, okay? For 20 minutes, the chimpanzees quietly gather around their friend despite offers of food to tempt them away. They gently touch and sniff his body, 
with chips who were closer friends with the deceased appearing to be the most upset. Grief is evident in many tribal animals. Grief comes at a huge biological cost. Reduced foraging, hunting, reduced reproduction, and for a chimpanzee, you know, pausing in the shagging is like, whoa, that's, that's <laughs> stopping, right? They're moving more slowly, so they're more likely to be uh, predated upon. They're under stress, which means there's a greater risk of both disease and being predated upon. So there's this huge biological cost to grief, and yet we see it in tribal animal after tribal animal. It's in whales, it's in dogs, right? It's in elephants, you know? So trauma and grief, they have to have some kind of a payoff here. Grief reaffirms the connections that we have to others, and grief is also the process by which we adjust to a loss, okay? Grief is healthy, okay? And that's why we evolved the capacity to grieve. If it weren't, we would not have it. Now, trauma is not exactly grief, but it's a lot like grief. The predominant emotion may not be sadness, it's horror or fear instead, but nonetheless, it's a powerful event that needs to be processed in some way. And I have yet to see a trauma in my office that does not involve some form of loss. Now, the loss is not usually of a loved one. It is usually of a treasured illusion, okay? If I'm a good driver, I'll be safe. Then, you know, the tire comes off the transport truck, comes crashing through your windshield, and the next thing you know, your skill as a driver is completely irrelevant. Bad things don't happen to good people. Children have their whole lives ahead of them. Okay. All people are essentially good. These are illusions, right? These are illusions that in trauma get torn away. Now, I'm going to move on to talk a little bit briefly about suicide and assessing how we go about ass assessing suicide risk. Thing to realize about suicide, number one, yes, five minutes. Very, I think I'm good, actually. That's excellent. I'm right on time. Thing about suicide is that maybe less of a desire for death than it is to escape pain, okay? So we need to recognize the pain that underlies that. Suicidal ideation can replace pain with a sense of control. Suicidal ideation can therefore be habit forming, okay? We feel out of control, you think I should just kill myself. That can literally be a habitual response to dealing with stress, gives you that little sense of control for a moment, Okay, while also feeding into it, not unlike any other addiction, right? Suicidal ideation is very, very common in oper operational stress injuries. I speak to suicidal people almost every day, okay? I take action maybe twice a year. So there's a huge gap between thinking about suicide and being at that level of risk. And this is important to realize because I think a lot of first responders are very hesitant to seek out my help because they're afraid if they go into my office and I say, so have you ever thought about suicide? Then they say, yes, I'm immediately going to put them in the hospital, right? And this is very far from the truth. I will assess what they need to, right? And assessing that risk is very important. But it's much more nuanced than have you ever thought of, of killing yourself, right? There's a lot more that goes into it like that. Although that's a very good question to ask. Okay, it's an excellent place to start. We need to know the answer to that question, but it's the beginning of an assessment, not the end of it. So how do we assess that risk? Well, first of all, is it a passive desire for death? Is it a fantasy of killing yourself? Is it an intent to kill the self? Is there a plan present? Is there access to the means to fulfill that plan? How lethal is the potentiality of that plan? How quick, too? Big concern I have with police officers. Right? They walk around all the time with the means to kill themselves strapped to their hip. They can go from thinking about it to completing the act within seconds. Right? That's scary as hell. Have there been rehearsals or preparation? Okay? This is a very common thing, and it's a, it's a danger sign in suicide, right? The guy who's gone into the garage and starts scanning the rafters. Right? Has there been communication? It is an absolute myth that people who really intend to kill themselves won't talk about it. 
Okay? In fact, most people who commit suicide do talk about it beforehand. Now, which is really scarier, those who talk about it or those who don't? Frankly, the ones who really scare me are the ones who won't answer my questions. They're the ones who, okay, <laughs> you're not answering here, or I'm getting a sense you're not answering me truthfully, that's scaring the hell out of me. So both are very scary, both answering and not answering that question. But most people do talk about it first. Those who don't talk about it don't give us a chance to help, and they may be the most help helpless, right? And that's scary as well. Preventing suicide. Suicide is certainly a major concern in OSIs, but it is still comparatively rare, okay? And I think this is so important because we hear so much about it, right? Again, remember what I was saying about how culture feeds into the response, and then the re you know, the, how we define it, how we think about it, feeds into the presentation. Think of the message that suicide equals PTSD equals suicide. Feeds into the risks, right? Yes, we hear so much, we need to hear so much about the suicide risk in first responders. The vast majority will not be attempting suicide. Only a small portion attempt suicide, even fewer commit suicide. But what we hear about are in fact the suicides or the violence, right? We hear about the people who drive their trucks into the you know, Veterans Affairs building, right? We, again, remember, our brains are so much better at responding to story and experience than they are to responding to statistics, right? So we, that, that sticks with us in a way that numbers don't. Stories of recovery are not front page news, which is why I love Badge of Life. I love everyone who's taking part in this, right? Because these are stories of recovery that we hear about here today, and those are so important. Now, Dr. D. Reiska is a uh, psychologist. Uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful person, does a tremendous work with uh, veterans. She came up with this idea of the buddy system, which I love, and I want to share this with you, okay? Don't go into danger unless somebody knows where you are, right? I saw the, the hashtag on the back of a hat in, in, in the video earlier. Hashtag, real heroes call for help. Real heroes call for help. Real heroes call for help. I wish I'd seen that before, that would be on this slide. Real heroes call for help. So this is what I want you to do right now, okay? I want you to visualize in your mind who the person is that you will call when you are in danger, okay? Who are you gonna tell when you need that help? Is it a friend, is it a spouse, is it a doctor, psychologist? Who's the person you are going to reach out to for help if you are in the darkest place, okay? Fix that in your mind right now. And then later on, tell that person, okay? Let them know that you, they are your support system. Every single one person in this room has somebody who will be for them, there for them no matter what, okay? Every single one. Choose your buddy. Thank you very much. This is my protector, this is my friend. And you know, some people look at it as you know a stigma or or uh, ooh, look, that guy or that girl has a dog and they're sick or uh, unhealthy, and, and that's so untrue, you know. So I, I, I wanna recognize you and I wanna thank you and, and I wanna honor you. And um, if your dog poops outside, make sure you clean it up. <laughs> um, Good. Yeah. Okay. Just, I have the pleasure to introduce um, Sean Taylor and Jill Foster. They're both paramedics and uh, EMS workers. They've um, they've got a great organization called I've Got Your Back 9/11, and and they're going to speak to that today. So please welcome. I'm going to talk without a mic. I typically don't need one anyway. So, um, my name is Sean Taylor. I'm a paramedic in Chatham and in Elgin County. And Jill Foster is a paramedic in Elgin as well as Bruce County. And we came up with this little brainstorm here. I don't know. 
I'm looking back on it now. I don't know if it was such a good idea, but that's, I'm just being funny with that. We'll save that story for later. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, we just started this. We were um, uh, we were just really concerned, me and paramedics, and uh, a true epidemic. We had um, we were losing about one first responder a week since about uh, May 29, 2014, for about a year and a half. So uh, we just sat down one day over a couple of beverages and some nachos and thought that we would just start something online just to create some awareness. Writing down ideas on some beer napkins and uh, doing searches on our phones to see how many websites came up containing that word or that series of words. We ended up with, I've got your back, 911, and absolutely nothing came up. So we said, that's what it is. And away we went two days later. We launched everything on social media. And within three days after that, we had over 600 messages sent to us saying, who's behind this, who's doing this, and then from there it just kind of took off. So we are two years and four months into uh, this social media campaign, and uh, we've been able to bring in and donate out uh, right around a quarter of a million dollars. bring in through the sale of all of our clothing and everything that we do, uh, we basically just turn back around again and donate it back out to different organizations and charities that deal with first responders and uh, those that are you know, dealing with PTSD. Uh, we've also set up a um, charitable fund in Elgin County, and so we can actually make donations through that charitable fund, and it goes to different organizations and charities again that we have listed, or a set of parameters that we have listed to organizations and charities that we want to go to. Um, the fund was a pretty big deal for us because uh, once Sean and I are um, long gone, uh, the fund will still stick around and uh, be able to fund people for the future. So. so that's our first picture right there that we, uh, that we put on our social media. And the whole premise behind it was obviously, I've got your back. Uh, emergency services, first responders, responding on scene. It's a very commonly used phrase, so that's what we went with. So that was the first picture that we posted and launched, and then it just went absolutely crazy from there with the thousands and thousands of pictures that we received with medics, with firefighters, with PD, corrections, dispatchers, you name it, posting their picture with our sign that says, I've got your back now. This photo ended up on uh, our local newspaper cover, and uh, we almost got fired for it, so <laughs> that's another story later, too. So we started this awareness campaign, and then all of a sudden, I kind of joke with Sean that all of a sudden we have our own clothing line. So we have an online store, and all of the money raised through the store gets donated back up to the community. So we have uh, t-shirts, hoodies, uh, tukes, hats, lanyards, things like that. And all the money from that just gets kicked right back out. So before we go into this, we also have a couple of um, patch quilts that we've had made. One of them is back in the back table over there that we're selling tickets for just to raise money for the quilt. It was uh, the materials and the time were donated by the two ladies that made the quilt for us. It's a queen size quilt. It's got 59 service patches on it from Canada and the U.S. And um, they basically said that they're going to make one of these quilts for us every year so we can auction them off, sell tickets, and just keep raising money through that. So take a look at the quilt. It's actually a, it's, it's a piece of art. Um, I've learned since I got into this whole quilting thing that uh, the way that they judge a quilt is how many stitches are in the quilt. So that quilt back there has 257,000 stitches in it. Sean's going to be making the next quilt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we could go over a mission statement. I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory up there. It is on our website. We have a ton of different resources on our website as well. So we don't want to have to just kind of read it, read it from there. So you can find it uh, on our website, wwwfguideyourback 911com So some of the different areas where we do put our support, the Tim O'Contrary uh, Memorial Fund, we donated $25,000 to those guys right away as soon as we had this influx of cash coming in, which basically paid for 
their entire documentary that um, is now just being released called The Other Side of the Hero. So we were in that. We haven't seen the final edit and final cut yet to see if we actually made the cut and if we're still in it. But I think we got cut. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we basically paid for that, um, that documentary that we made. National Service Dogs, we have committed to them to sponsoring a certain number of animals so that uh, we actually get to name the dog, we actually get to be there for the dog's graduation, and then present that dog to the first responder. So what they do, this is kind of a funny story, but what they do is they every time they have a litter of dogs, they want to name the dog first letter of that next letter of the alphabet. So we were told that we had to come up with a name for the dog. It started with a P. <laughs> So we're pondering it and pondering it, and me and Joe are working one day together, and we're going to an NBC, and we're arriving on scene, there's a whole bunch of fire trucks around, there's cops, everybody around to control the scene, and as you all know, when, you know, where do you want us to, where do you want to park, where do you want us to park? So, Parker here, Parker there. Exactly. <laughs> so, our dog's name is Parker. <laughs> Uh, we do a lot of sponsorship with the um, with all, a lot of the rides that are around right now, just to create awareness. You'll see our logo, our hashtag on a lot of their uniforms, on their kits that they wear during the rides. So that's one of the things that gives us a ton of exposure. Obviously, teaming up with the great guys uh, and women from uh, Badger Life, um, being able to do these conferences with them, come out, sell our stuff, have our presence here and stuff. And obviously, there's the documentary, and then. Bill 163, uh, the First Responders Act that was uh, brought into Ontario, and then obviously the last one, which is a federal bill that just got passed as well. So we were down at Queen's Park, and we were there for that, the announcement and everything else. So it was pretty cool to walk into the media room that holds about 250 people, and there's probably 50, 70 people there with our hoodies and t-shirts on, and we walked in, and that was pretty cool to see. So we have to pinch ourselves every once in a while, and because sometimes we don't even know how big this thing has gotten, but we've received pictures from, you know, Hong Kong, from New Zealand, from Holland, from Germany, all over the place, wearing our gear and um, holding up our signs. This is just uh, a photo of us with um, Theo Fleury. We uh, sponsored an event with him, and um, Enrico Colantino from uh, Flashpoint. So they're uh, both big supporters of the campaign. We presented a check. And uh, that's just from that day, so. Uh, just a few more active projects uh, that we've kind of been working on. Um, I'm not sure if everyone aware, everyone here is aware that there's a mental health walk-in clinic in London, um, which we've really been trying to push because people often come to us and ask us for resources. And uh, Sean and I are paramedics, we're not counselors, we're not therapists, so we need to be able to sort of redirect these people to uh, Higher professionals, I guess you could say. So we'll uh, we'll post up the information for the walking clinic on the end here, just in case you don't know about it. And then we've also developed a website with uh, lots of resources. Um, you can go onto our website, and and there's lots of different options for resources on there. We just got back from Connecticut. We were down there for a EMS conference down in Connecticut. We were down there for five days. Um, had a booth sold stuff, we were invited back again for next year, and then they asked us to be presenters next year as well, so we're going to be going down there to do that. Um, some of the other things we have coming up, we were invited to the World EMS Expo down in Vegas in October, so we're going to go down there and do that. Conference out in PEI in September, it just keeps kind of going. Yeah, people um, have been really receptive to us, and uh, have been really kind to us, so they often will offer up a table for us for free to just kind of come down and spread the good word. So normally these tables can cost like $5,000 at a big expo, so we uh, get the tables donated to us. So we're very grateful for that. These are some of the pictures from Queens Park. So Kevin Flynn, um, we still haven't received a picture of him actually wearing the shirt, but he was presented with a shirt Too there. Too small. Um, <laughs> He kind of gave me this strange look when we first got introduced to him because for about a year, um, he would receive, his office was receiving about 25 emails a week from our campaign. And I would attach one of the stories that was sent to us. Um, 
that we get on a daily basis. We have thousands of stories that are both horrific of perseverance, um, and uh, one of those stories was attached to every single one of those emails. So I was probably put on the watch this guy for stalking list, and uh, when he actually did meet us and he was introduced to us and heard my name, he kind of gave me a, a different look. So. He ran from the room. <laughs> I'm pretty sure where that came from. So, but those are just some of the pictures, and it was a huge day for us and for first responders in Ontario, for sure. And now, you know, a whole bunch of different services that have uh, put our sticker on their vehicles. So I think we're up to 57 services now throughout Canada that have our stickers on all their emergency response vehicles, whether it's ambulances, whether it's uh, police cars, whether it's um, fire trucks as well. So um, when they come to us, we will donate the stickers to their service, free of charge, to put on all their vehicles, and, you know, we're elated every time we get asked for those stickers for sure. Uh, we sponsor a lot of bike teams as well, a lot of uh, paramedic bike teams, police bike teams. Um, these really have nothing to do with uh, PTSD, but they have, do have to do with cancer. So um, these guys usually reach out to us every year, and because it's a great cause, we help them out as well. Okay. And because they are first responders. They the ride. Yeah. So this was a big day for us because it took us um, two years for our service where this whole thing started to put the stickers on our vehicles. So I think we had 39 other services put them on their vehicles before we got them on ours. We had to go and we had to present to council. We had to do jump all through those hurdles in order to get the approval. And they, their big argument with us was the fact that we do not put any other stickers on our vehicles. So, when I presented to them and I showed them all the other services that had our stickers on their vehicles, and then the last one was actually when they had the international plowing match in Alga County, they actually did put stickers on our vehicles. So, it was pretty tough for them to say no to us after that. So, within 24 hours, we got word that we could go ahead and put them on all our trucks. Do we have any of our management here today? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, well, you're Tracy, okay. Tracy, you get a free hoodie, just don't comment on that. <laughs> yeah, this was a bit of a big deal for us because um, management was quite obstinate in the beginning for whatever reasons, but they've seemed to open up a little bit now. So once we started the campaign, we noticed that um, it was, it was just kind of spreading, like acts of kindness were spreading throughout the different cities. And um, lots of things like this were sort of popping up all over the place. So it would be nothing for, you know, us to come out to our ambulance and there would be a, you know, a gift card for um, Tim Hortons tucked underneath our windshield. And, and this idea started to kind of catch on. So people were snapping photos and sending them in to us, being like, hey, look, look it's, it's kind of spreading like wildfire. So this is just an example of that. I think this was in Toronto. This ended up on an ambulance in Toronto. So. Happy. Um, so we really wanted to bring uh, everyone into sort of our house. So we do support we support police, fire, EMS, corrections, uh, ER nurses, and dispatch. So this is just an example. This is PC Poppy from uh, uh, Toronto. I'm sure a few of you know him. This was just us down at the expo um, in Connecticut, spreading the good word with uh, Holly from Nightwatch, if any of you know her. She's a big supporter of ours. And then occasionally we like to put these signs up around uh, Elgin County just to sort of, uh, you know, build the spirits and build some camaraderie amongst the services in Elgin. So this is a, a good friend of mine, her son, Nicholas. Uh, he's really taken to the campaign. Uh, every three months, I got to make Jill, who's my friend, Nicholas's mother. I have to make her some new shirts for Nicholas because Nicholas is now over 900 days in a row wearing our shirts. Um, he had to actually go get permission by his principal not to wear his uniform shirt at school and to be able to wear our shirt. Um, so he, they were going to Ottawa and they were going to do a tour of Parliament and he asked me to make a shirt for the Prime Minister and he wrote a letter 
talking about the campaign and everything else. So um, Prime Minister Trudeau did actually respond, sent him a letter back, indicating our campaign and stuff in the letter, saying how proud he was of that. So now, since then, uh, now that Nicholas is over 900 days, we've just found out I got a request for some medium shirts because he's now written a letter and sent off a package to Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> So, we'll see what happens. Well, you know if we're going to be on the Ellen Show. <laughs> this is not my family, but uh, it was just a photo sent in. So, you can kind of see the popularity in the campaign. People, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's branded properly, I don't know if people love the, the concept, but we get a lot of photos like this sent in to us. Uh, just kind of a, a nice family sort of gathering. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's Nicholas uh, in the middle there with his blue t-shirt on and um, they ran a couple lemonade stands and they were raking leaves uh, to donate that money to Paramedic Nat if everybody knows who Paramedic Nat is and trying to help her raise money to get her service dog so they wanted to do this and they donated I think it was $140 or something to Nat for her dog and then another friend of ours uh, his service dog was sick did some tests and all that sort of stuff so they went out and they raked leaves in their neighborhood for about a month and raised 100 bucks 150 bucks and then donated it to uh, Andrew to help with the cost of you know the tests and everything for his service dog. We just wanted to put a picture of Bill on here because we <laughs> love him so much. So, <laughs> so we have service patches or we have yes. patches there as well that a lot of people all have to kind of take it to and they put them on their vests for their dogs and um, you know, backpacks and everything else, so you'll see those around as well. Uh, this is Marcel. He's around here somewhere. He'll be, uh, there he is. <laughs> He'll be uh, speaking a little bit later. And uh, that's uh, Tegan, his service dog. So we've uh, kind of helped out with, with that dog as well, here and there. There's our charitable fund number, and we're on social media everywhere. And if you want to follow us, like anything that we put on, and so 125 Woodward Ave is a mental uh, clinic that's here in London, and uh, they are funded by the Train Foundation. So they only have their doors open on Tuesdays from 1 to 7, but in our meetings with them, trying to see if we can give them some funding to keep those doors open longer, um, you do get, I do believe it's nine free uh, visits with a professional, uh, one hour visits, in order to you know, try to assist you and help you out, and yeah. And you can find us. <laughs> Save some water for the fish. <laughs> so basically, that's us in a nutshell. We thank everybody yeah. for coming to the event today. And thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Guys.